Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those. Yes. Sure. Oh, absolutely. I agree. You know, we are such an instant society, I demand it right now. And if you don't do it right now, then it's no, 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 no. God's going to do it in his timing, not my timing, not your timing, his timing. And it's going to be perfect. And sometimes you just need to go through it, trust him, and keep pursuing and keep hanging on to the promise, keep thanking the Lord that he's healing you, thanking you that you received the word of promise, that you received the word of prophecy, and just continue on in that manner. And when it happens, then you give a, a praise. And they overcame by the word of the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. That's why we have testimonies. You know, it, it's because God is a healing God. And by the way, if you don't have test, all you have is money. And, and, and uh, so you've got to have that test so you can have a testimony. You know, you've you got to be able to get through it with God. And... Uh, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. They put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. goes on Isaiah, the 5th chapter, 20th verse. God is listing some things that he's having problems with Israel on. And I'll tell you what, we're in a day and an age where my head spins at times. You've got to be kidding me. You really think that's good? You're endorsing that? Paul, in the... In the First chapter of Romans, he begins uh, by... By the way, Paul begins Romans, and if you have Romans 1.1 1, 1 in front of you, he begins by saying, I'm the lowest servant on a slave ship. He's the, the, the word he uses is third-tier rower. That means he's the third tier down of the slaves. He's got his back to where they're going, and the only thing he can see is the back of the head or the back of the back of the guy, the slave that's on the oar. He has no idea. He just knows that he's just keep rowing. And so he starts Romans, and he gives his self-description. And he gets into there, and he says, now, it's, I don't know, about verse 10, 12, somewhere in there, he says, you know, the people go down this path, and it's the path when people reject God's morals, they reject God's principles, they reject God. And he winds up saying at the end of chapter 1 in, in Romans. For they know God's justice. He talks about all the, the perversion. He talks about injustice. He talks about stealing. He talks about uh, improper judges and everything else. He talks about greed. They know God's justice requires that those that do these things deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. And even worse yet, he says, even worse yet, they encourage others to do them. I put in my Bible, and in a couple of my, I put, they vote people in to do them. This is God's Word. Agreed? The Bible. Okay. And God's Word, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. By the way, given by inspiration of God is one word in Greek. It's God breathed. It just means God breathed. It's just one word. All, all Scripture is God-breathed, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in right living, so that the person of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Hebrews says, For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Second Timothy 2, 4, 15, 2, 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Not approved to man, but approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
I read a number of verses here concerning God's Word, concerning what's right and what's wrong. We are in election year. You are about to hear 40 years of pastoring, 40 years of senior pastoring. I'm going to preach the most political sermon I've ever preached. That was for the camera. We have heard and heard and heard about what excellent candidates on both sides of the donkey elephant are running. Both sets of candidates are pure as the driven snow, wonderful as light-footed angels. Both of them are so marvelous, or so they would have you believe. I'm here to tell you that there are no perfect candidates. There is not a candidate running for office in the United States who is perfect. Everyone has skeletons in their closets, habits and traits that aren't good. There is a negative onslaught of not only positive but negative news about both candidates and how both candidates, both parties claim the other candidate will bring the ruination to this nation. News wants us to solely focus on the character. And of course, the character that they want us to focus on is the character of the candidate that they endorse. And while character counts, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's one of the reasons we serve such a gracious and loving Savior. We can come and we can lift up our heads. Zion will, will do something and then he'll slap his own hand. <laughs> you know, we just come to the Lord and, and just by acknowledgement, Father, I've sinned. Forgive me. That's how we need to approach the Father. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. I believe the Word of God teaches us we need to look at the principles, the morals, and the platforms of each party and what they present. We need to pray and vote the party that lines up as close to the Word of God as possible. All Scripture is in God-breathed and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Scripture corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. My friends, if we're not reading if we're not spending time in the Word, we are missing out on God's instructions for rightly living. Friends, God's Word, not a politician's promises, is where we need to find our hope. We have a responsibility to use the freedom we have in this land to elect representatives. Please hear me say that. We do not, rep we do not elect leaders. We represent people to we, we elect people to represent us. We are a republic, not a democracy. We have a responsibility to use the freedoms we have in this land to elect representatives who most align with God's Word. And again, I want to remind you that there's no perfect candidates out there. There's none. Now, we just need to elect the one or ones who are closest aligned to God's Word. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. But I will tell you it's a biblical duty to pray and vote. We get to elect our representatives and leaders that should represent what we stand for. The people that we elect should represent what we stand for. Is that true? Do we believe the Word of God? Do we believe the words, the values, the t what it teaches, the principles, the morals? Then that's where we should find it. Not out of some politician's promises of hope, but out of hope through Jesus Christ our Lord, hope in His Word. 
Unfortunately, there are 25 million unregistered to vote Christians in this nation. This should not be so among us. Christians that believe that it's not their responsibility to get involved in politics do not understand the Word of God, in my opinion. No, no, the Word of God is very clear that where God places us, I believe God places, I believe He put President, I believe He put Vice President Pence right where He's supposed to be. There is a man of God. Talk about getting flack. That poor guy gets flack. You know, he has the Billy Graham rule. And anybody know, Billy Graham, when they put their team together and they stuck together for a million years, um, in the early 50s, they made rules out. And one of the rules that they made and kept, every one of them, this is why none of the Graham team ever fell in that way. They would never be alone with a woman. They wouldn't go to dinner with a woman unless it was their wife. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even ride in an elevator. When uh, Franklin came to Ketchikan and then Sitka, I was um, part of the team that was working on both um, crusades. And a man named White, who was one of the original Graham people, was there. And he was in an elevator. A lady got in, and he just, Greg, could you come in here? Sure. So I went up. <laughs> they all got off. I got back on, went back down to where I was supposed to go. Because he, he didn't say, I I'm not going to ride in an elevator alone with a woman. But he said, Greg, please come get in the elevator. And I got in the elevator, went up, came back down. But that, that's how clear they are. And Pence gets, I don't know if you know this, but Vice President Pence made that vow 40 years ago. And now he's been accused of, put, of installing a glass ceiling over women. See, it doesn't matter what you do, they're going to come after you. They're going to call right wrong and wrong right. That's just part of the life that is in the world. In the last days, we've all read the verses, that they're going to cry out for those who, whose itching ears are going to distort the Word of God. We need to be people who pray and then vote the Word of God. Apostle Paul talks about the downward spiral of mankind and when they reject God. They reject His principles, morals, and values. He ends the chapter with this. And they know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, die, yet they do them anyway. And even worse than that, they encourage others to do them too. They vote them in as their representatives. That's what I, my little addendum on that. They vote them in as their representatives. Loved ones, when we pray and then vote, we need to be voting for the party of the person who most clearly aligns to God's word in principles, morals, and values. Not those who are just saying, we're doing God's work. But we need to vote for those who are aligning to God's word in the work that they do. Therefore, I will pray and vote for the most pro-life candidate because God hates the shedding of innocent blood. There are six things that the Lord hates. No seven things that He detests. Haughty eye, lying tongue, and I'll just go to the third one. Hands that kill the innocent. I uh, saw a picture, maybe some of you saw it. By the way, these things that I've got here are not original to me. I was, I was writing the sermon, and I was writing out some things, and then I saw part of this on Facebook, and I thought, boy, that's pretty cool. But anyway, I saw a picture on Facebook that just breaks your heart. It's a newborn, uh, probably it was aborted at nine months. But it shows defensive wounds, slices on the hands where the baby's trying to protect itself before it's killed. Those that shed innocent blood. Those that support those. They, 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 they do wrong. They know it's wrong. They encourage others to do wrong. And they elect officials who agree with them in their wrongness. They encourage others. Even worse, they encourage others. So when I vote, my number one line in the sand my personal number one line in the sand, you have yours, I have mine, is abortion. 
it's abortion. I understand. No, I don't. Yes, I do. I can emphasize or empathize, empathize with a woman who's had, who felt she had no choice, who felt she was trapped, who felt anything she felt but without hope, and she had an abortion. There's forgiveness for that, and there is a God in heaven who has that baby, and that baby is not calling you guilty. That baby is waiting to meet you. That baby is a human. Well, whatever we are in heaven. And I want to encourage you, if you've had an abortion, go to God and get, allow Him to touch you, to heal you. I have books in my office. I, I bought a case of them. I bought a couple of cases of them. It's called I'll Hold You in Heaven. It's for, for women who have had miscarriages or abortions. And it's God's comfort and God's promises. It's still my line in the sand. I've had people leave this church. Well, you just don't understand the situation. You don't. I know I don't understand. I'm not a woman. Praise God. <laughs> but the reality is there's forgiveness there's forgiveness and, and we need all of us to have forgiveness in our life And if, 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 just take it to God that's my line in the sand as an adopted child a prime candidate for an abortion had it been illegal when I was conceived my line in the sand is I will vote for the most pro-life candidate because God hates the shedding of innocent blood. Psalms 139 says that while we were being formed, even before we are formed in our mother's womb, God knew the days for us. He had plans for us. Ephesians 2.10 says before the foundation of the world, God had plans for us to accomplish. All life is precious in God's sight, even to the pre-born who are the most innocent. I will pray and vote for the most pro-Israel candidate because God blesses those who bless Israel and curses those who don't. Genesis 12, 3. So what I'm saying is all our life needs to align by the Word of God. We need to look at God's Word on a decision. When I was in Bishop, we would have the head, we had literally in our church, we had the head of Inyo County Republican Party and we had the head of the Inyo County Democratic Party, both attending, families both attending our church. And they both did, and they were, they were civil to each other. And it was interesting because at election time, I would hold a community-wide, we, we held about 250, 300, and we would have a Sunday night where the head of both parties would come and they would present their cases, everything on the ballot. And then I would give, if there was a biblical viewpoint, because there are some things that don't have a vi biblical viewpoint on the ballot, amen? There are some things that you, know, you just got to decide. Do you want to fund another library? You know, that's up to you. You know, you've got to hear from God on that. But, and, and, but we, and we'd, be, we'd have 300-plus people every time. But it was good to get both sides of the argument. It was good to understand them both, wherever they're coming from. But I, I remember at the same time was the Desert Storm, 1990. And I was invited to speak at the community college about, you know, the, the Israel, the Jewish, Arab conflict, even though Desert Storm wasn't directly involved with that, and, and just use scriptures. And, and, and of course, it, it always gets in. Whenever you're in a public debate about Israel, it's always, well, they stole that land. Well, I, would you like to know a little historical fact? Canaan land was given to a guy named Abram. Abram happened to father a guy named Ishmael. Ishmael happened to father 12 sons. And the Arabs and Muslims to take Abraham 
as their grandfather. They, they have all the way up to Abraham in their book. And then they take off on Ishmael. They run their line through Ishmael. Now, interesting thing is, Abram was called to be chosen of God, to create, the, for the lack of a better word, the Jewish culture or the Jewish race. There's only one race, the human race, but the Jewish culture. Out of Abram came the Arab race. So when Arabs say, well, that was our land first, no, you weren't even a culture, you weren't even a named race yet. Canaan was given to Abram, the Jews, in antiquity by God. And God said, I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those who don't or those who curse you. I will bless those who bless you, Genesis 12, 3. There's the Abram, what we call the Abrahamic covenant. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Romans tells us that we are grafted into the covenant and the blessings of God. In 1948, Israel became a nation again. On the day they became a nation, which is smaller than a county in Oregon, by the way, five nations immediately attacked them. They attacked them with jets, tanks, and everything else. Does anybody know what Israel's Air Force consisted of in 1948? One Piper Cub. One. You know what a Piper Cub is? It's the one step up from a tomahawk. The tomahawk is a little bubble thing that only, it's only a two-seater. The Piper you can actually cram three skinny people into but by God's grace. And even to this day, you've read where we sent over missiles, but they kept exploding in the sky. I will bless those that bless you. I will pray, and I will vote for the most pro-Israel candidate because God blesses those who bless Israel. It doesn't talk about just doing things for Israel. It talks about blessing Israel, God's people. We can argue all night about whether Israel has a right to be a nation, because they do. Israel is the only nation in the Middle East where you realize they have Arabs and they have Muslims in their cassette, in their Congress. Mayors within Israel are Muslims, duly elected. It's an amazing, it's the only democratic country in the Middle East. And they're still there, and God's still blessing them. So I'll pray and vote for the most pro-Israel candidate because the Word of God tells me to. I will pray and vote for the most pro-debt reduction candidate because the borrower is servant to the lender. Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Amen? You go ahead and borrow some money and miss a few payments and see what happens. You go ahead and borrow some money and and then decide you're not going to pay it back and see what happens. The borrow is servant to the lender. And, and, And I hope that we're all consciously aware. We should, Paul writes in Romans 13, 8, owe no man anything except to love them. We need to all be striving to be financially debt-free. The debt that we have is to love people. Well, I have a house payment. Well, you're gonna, you you got to put some place and, and as quick as you can pay it off. We, we watch uh, house hunters, both international and national. And we watched a couple of young people yesterday. A million dollars, 900 and some thousand they had to spend. I want a castle. I want a castle. I, I mean, grow up. I want a castle. 
I want rooms. I'm gonna, uh, I want rooms for my cats. I have two cats, and they don't get along with your dog. And, and, and so I want rooms. I mean, I was going, wow, let me see them on Thursday. I can straighten them out. Or give me 500 bucks, and I'll get rid of your cats forever. <laughs> It was a trip, and he had some dog. I mean, they're buying a, a million-dollar house for dogs and cats. They're going, I mean, and he wanted a castle. He was just like a little child. I want a castle. I want a castle. And then they bought one that had pillars out front, looked like the White House. Oh, that'll do. And they wound up buying one that looked like a castle. 14,600 square feet. Yeah, 14,600 square feet for two people. But her cats got their own floor. Yeah, they get to clean their own floor. I wouldn't live on their floor. I'm not anti-cat. I'm pro-dog. Cat tastes good. I've had it. Dog tastes good. I've had that. Camel tastes good. I've had that. Cow, horse tastes good. I've had that. Whale tastes good. I've had that. I've had rattlesnake. But we need to be careful for getting in debt. Number one problem in marriages is finances. Number one. Disagree on finances. Get into debt. Any of you who have been married more than six days um, realize what happens when somebody spends something they shouldn't spend. You hear the bus coming? <laughs> ah, watch, I won't tell it. Oh, you want to hear it, huh? <laughs> you want to see me get in trouble, don't you? <laughs> we will, I, I will pray for the most pro-debt reduction candidate because borrower is a servant to the lender. Oh, no man anything but to love that one. Do you know that Jesus spoke more about finances than he did heaven and, earth, heaven and hell combined? What was one of the con major contributing factors to the Roman Empire? Massive amounts of unsecured debt. What will bring ruination to one's life, one's nation, is massive amounts of unstainable debt. And we need to be careful for it. I'm going to vote for the candidate that doesn't want to keep giving away three free stuff. I will pray and vote for the most pro-work candidate because God says if a person won't work, don't let him eat. Listen to Thessalonians 3. For even when we were with you, we commanded you, imperative verb, imperative mood. We command you. There's no wiggle room here, folks. If someone will not work. If anyone will not work, neither shall they eat. They had people, now let me finish reading it, for we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. So obviously they had social agitators and social community workers in their day too. You ever been to the National Park and see those signs? Do not feed the animals. You ever see why? Because the animals will become dependent upon you. They'll forget how to forge. And then they'll begin to associate you with food. So if you want to get attacked by a bear, go feed him every week in the national park. And then show up one week and not feed him. They were building a new bridge out near Heidelberg. And I was doing the census out on Prince of Wales. And... If you drive by the construction site, now that bridge took a few months, more than a few months to do, and if you drive by the construction site at 5 o'clock where the bridge was going up, there'd be three bears there. And if you stopped your car, three black bears, they would come up to your car. Why? 
because the construction workers, when they got done with work every day, they would see what they had left in their lunch pails and they would feed the bears. And it only took three months for the bears to become so accustomed they'd walk right up to your car looking for a handout if you stopped your car. I pray and I will vote for the most pro-work candidate because God says if a person won't work, doesn't mean can't work, doesn't mean can't find a job. They won't work. I won't do that job. That's beneath me. I, I, when I took the job as a, a postman, as a rural route carrier, the man at the, the post, uh, the head of the post office for Ketchikan was a great guy, Terry, and, and he said, what are you doing? He says, you're, you're way too highly educated and qualified for this job. And I said, because I need money. You know, that's a bottom line where you got a job. I mean, and it turned out to be one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life, especially with the people I worked with at the post office. They were phenomenal people. But you just got to take a job. Sometimes you got to take a job. You got to work the job. Amen? You got to make some money. Oh, it's beneath me. No, it's not. Hey, I've cleaned out. You want to know a stinky job? Nah, that's not a stinky job. It's just gross. I, I sold lady shoes at Leeds Shoe Store for a while. I cleaned out the holds of fishing boats. They come in, and then when you get them all cleaned out, and all the slime and all the yuck is on side, and it, oh, good, on a day like today, ah, cleans out the nostrils. You know what it not only cleans out? It cleans out the stomach. <laughs> but I'd get paid to be down there at 4 o'clock in the morning. The fish would already be out of the boat. But all the slime and the excess ice and everything would be left in, and it'd be my job to shovel off out of the ice, clean up, get, get brooms and saw uh, and uh, power washers, and power wash the inside of the boat. Why did I do that? Because I needed money. Because I was in between jobs, and I was more than happy to. Hey, it wasn't the most pleasant job, but probably not the worst one I've ever done. I mean, I changed a kid's diaper one time. <laughs> I will pray and vote for the most pro-work candidate because God says if a person won't work, don't let him eat. Again, it's not that they can't find a job. But sometimes we've got to take jobs that aren't in our field. Sometimes you've just got to take a job that, that's... I, I would show up Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 o'clock dressed to work. And on the second lap around, when I showed up every morning at the store, he says, go to work. He says, you're more on time than half my employees. Just go punch in, and we'll figure everything out later. So I got a job, just showing up. You know, we need to be people who are willing to work, amen? And we need to be people who vote for people, pray and vote for people who want to provide jobs, Amen? Don't feed the animals. That'll make them dependent upon you, and they will forget how to forage for their own food and eventually starve. They'll come to associate you with the source of food, and they'll, they'll come for you. If you've never ridden, read The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, it's an interesting book. It's about 800 pages, and it's detailed in some places, but it's also detailed in uh, the fact that it gives you the reasons, some of the reasons that the Roman Empire failed. One of them is massive, unsustainable debt. The second one that they gave, and it wasn't, it's not in this order, and the more clear it is, was the government's attempt to distract people from their corruption in government by offering professional sports Games in the Colosseums, chariot racing, gladiators fighting, Christians being fed for the be to the beasts for the enjoyment of the crowds. And all the while, the Romans would roll out great wagons of bread and wine. Free. They'd just roll it in and people would come and get what they ever needed to eat and they'd get their jugs of wine and they'd go sit in the Colosseum and, and watch all the professional athletes and watch the Christians get devoured by lions. They'd get their free stuff, 
and they'd go watch people die. All the while being distracted and seduced from what the government was actually doing. To this one, I got to say, learn from history or be doomed to repeat it. I will pray and I will vote for the most pro-work candidate because God's word says if a man won't work, don't let him eat. I will pray and vote for the most pro-biblical marriage candidate because God is for marriage as defined in Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. God invented sex. He invented marriage and viva la difference between man and woman. Long live the difference. May the line never be blurred. And God created them, Adam and Steve. No, 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 Adam and Eve. I'm going to vote for the most pro-biblical candidate when it comes to marriage. This defines what a marriage is, right here. It's not my opinion. Look, I know gay people. I know homosexual people. I, I know sodomites, and I know lesbians. And it's just not God's best for them. It's not God's plan. It doesn't make them horrible people. It doesn't make them unloving or unlovely. In fact, a lot of homosexuals that I know are more loving than a lot of Christians that I know. But the reality is we just got to love them to life through Jesus Christ. We do not change our stance. We do not try to misinterpret the Word of God. We just stand in love. And when we talk to Him, we tell Him, this isn't God's best. This isn't God's plan. God's got a better plan. Jesus knows what it feels like to be alienated. Jesus knows what it feels like. Jesus' own brothers and sisters called Him crazy. Publicly. He's a nut job. Drag Him out of there. So I'm going to stand for the biblical concept and the biblical formation of marriage as defined in God's Word. God designed a man and a woman to raise the children. That's why I'm so, so anti-divorce. Yet it happens. It's not the end of the world. But the statistics tell us that single children, especially single men raised by a mother, do not have a leg up in life. Government statistics, I pulled these down from the government statistics, on children raised by single mother, 63% of children youth suicides, 90% of all homeless and runaway youth, 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders, 71% of all high school dropouts, 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions, 75% of all adolescents, in patients and subsistence abuse centers. 75% of all rapists all come from single homes. Over 80% of all men in prison come from a single home, single, single parent. God has ordained that a marriage is between a man and a woman. They need to stick together. They need to pray together. They need to raise their children together. Be at peace with all people as much as is possible with you. Marriage is give and take. Amen? I will vote for the most pro-biblical marriage candidate because God is for marriage as defined in Genesis 2.21. Amen? I will pray and vote as close as I can to God's word. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, I'll read another translation. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful to teach us what is true, 
to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It points out what's wrong as well as what's right. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us what to do right. God uses it to prepare, prepare and equip His people to do every good work, to vote righteously. It teaches us how we should vote and for whom we should vote. I'm not telling you, but I'm, telling, I'm not telling you how to vote, but I would ask that you register to vote and that you vote. I ask that when you line up to vote, that you line up with God's Word. Because not only do we li- need to vote according to God's Word, we need to live according to God's Word. I pray each of us, loved ones, takes time to pray, to read God's Word and align our lives accordingly. The precepts, the principles, and the pronouncements in God's Word. And then vote. Amen? You have just endured the most political sermon I've ever preached. But I'm going to tell you, I believe this is a critical election. And I'm going to talk a lot more about what the Word of God says concerning certain things that are on different platforms. I start again, I will vote for the most pro-life candidate there is. That's my line in the sand. But I'll tell you what, I will vote the Word of God. And it's amazing, even when we'd have those debates in Bishop with the two head of the parties, and, and, and there would be things like, do you want to spend $100 million or you know, in a community like Bishop, do you want to spend $4 million on a, a new section of the park? I'd really pray, do, we want to, do you want our property taxes to go up? You know, for renters, that's never a problem. It's never a problem for people who rent or don't own a business. Sure, let's get more, 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 more. But we need to look at biblically. You know, I... I, They they just put in a new tax in California this last year, and Heidi's taxes went up how much? Or how? almost, Almost 800 a month. It was like 10000 a year, more taxes. People who, who rent, pff, yeah, let's get more. But we need to be people who vote. We need to not just vote God's word, we need to live by God's word. Amen? Amen. Amen.